Good morning and welcome to the Seraphim Space Investment Trust results webinar. Um, I'm joined by Will Whitehorn, Chair, Mark Boggart, CEO, and James Brugger, the CIO. Seraphim are going to make a short presentation which will highlight the main features of the results this morning before we break for Q&A. Do please use the text box on your screen to reach out directly with questions for the Seraphim team. And with that, let me hand over to Will Whitehorn, who will introduce the results. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the quarter three results for Seraphim Space Investment Trust, PLC. Just as a way of sort of make economic background, this has been a really strong period for the space industry globally. We are seeing a lot more government money coming in on the back of both um, the climate change initiatives uh, undertaken after COP26, both for climate mitigation and climate monitoring. And space companies are in the forefront of providing these new services to governments around the world and to private companies and to things like the insurance industry. We're also seeing a growth in the use of communication satellites in space, which is moving apace at the moment. It's also been a time for record budgets in space defence projects, following what's happened in Ukraine and the quite obvious forefront role that satellites have taken. We have seen governments from around the world increasing their budgets in space and in some cases creating space agencies. From our point of view, the Seraphim Space Index of Global Space Investment Activity, which is uh, the investment of private money into private companies, we've seen an increase in 60% over the lows of the previous quarter. And we've certainly witnessed that in our own companies in particular, some of which have completed rounds during this period and the valuations have held up. We've also seen a number of our portfolio companies and some of the largest ones win big government contracts. The team led by Mark will talk to you about that today. But um, it, to give you an example, ISI, which is our biggest single investment, has signed a very big contract with the UAE. And there is a trend amongst all of the major companies that we invest in to see contracts from government and the private sector increasing. So without further ado, I will move on to Mark, but I'd also like to say that we've also seen increasing um, use of new space launch companies, and these have been largely successful. You'll have witnessed a couple of high profile space launches that didn't work, but do remember, Seraphim does not invest in space launch. We invest in space technology companies. Over to Mark. Thank you, Will, and uh, good morning, everyone. Can we move on to slide number three, please? So before I go into the detail of the interims, I wanted to take a step back to remind folks about the big picture for Seraphim. So we're the most prolific investor in the space market globally. We've got a portfolio of over 100 portfolio companies across both our public and uh, private activities. We, uh, alongside the trust, we run an early stage global accelerator program, which allows us to support space tech companies through their entire life cycle. So the accelerator acts like a feeder to our own funds. It's a programmatic due diligence platform where we can evaluate companies at scale and then through SSIT, we can double down with conviction on the best performing companies. So this is a model that's thriving. With this accelerator now in its 11th cohort, with dual programs operating in Europe and the US four times a year. It's also worth reminding shareholders that we're a value add investor. We're a hands-on investor. We join the boards of nearly all of our portfolio companies and this allows us to be able to build conviction as we help support those businesses and then we invest into, into later rounds. So information asymmetry and conviction is the bedrock of our past and our future successes. So now let's turn to SSIT and to this quarter's results. If we move to page four, please. So starting with the, uh, with the highlights, so um, a, a relatively pedestrian um, turnout. Uh, NAV is largely flat um, versus the last quarter, but the share price has continued to suffer falls. The market cap of 90 million at the end of the quarter versus a NAV of 222 million, which includes 40 million of cash equivalents. So this implies a huge discount 
on the carrying value of our investments, which we don't believe is justified given the strong performance of the overall portfolio, and in particular, the downside protections that we have in place across all of the portfolio with things like liquidation preferences. These protect the core value of our investments. So drawing your attention to the chart on the right-hand side, you can see there the SSIT share price performance is largely correlated with our AIC peer group. So these are, are other public investment funds that invest into private companies. But you can see that we've underperformed during the quarter and then recovered um, just after the quarter end. So um, we, we take some, um, uh, some, some, um, some, some comfort in the fact that the discount is across all of our peers. It's not just about Seraphim. It's not focused on space. It's really focused on investment vehicles that are investing into private companies. So during this presentation, I hope to convincingly explain why SSIT is going to be well positioned to close this uh, discount gap when the sentiment returns around technology and, uh, uh, and, and private companies. SSIT has a clear number of increasingly evidenced drivers that mark us out differently from the generalist nature of our AIC peer group. So if we can just move on to uh, slide number five, this will then uh, allow us to, uh, to dig into some of the detail, starting with the attribution analysis table. So the portfolio is holding up well. Uh, this is reflective of our portfolio companies continuing to close out additional funding, growing their revenues, achieving important milestones. So the value of the portfolio is marginally decreased from 181.2 million to 180.2 million during the period. A modest 1.2 million increase in portfolio value is actually offset by 2.5 losses in FX for the period. So the portfolio value remains close to cost, 96%. Moving on to slide number six, please. So this is the balance sheet as at the 31st of March. And this table sets out the NAV bridge. So the NAV decreased by 2.3 million pounds over the period to 219.7 million versus 222 million as the opening position. So besides the 1.3 million decrease in unrealized fair value of the portfolio, other contributing factors were the management fees and expenses of around a million. NAV per share marginally decreased during the period from 93 pence to 92 pence. But it's really important to, uh, to focus on the fact that we've got 18% of our NAV in cash so that we can continue to support the portfolio uh, going forwards. If we move to slide seven, please. Now, this next slide gives us an overview of the activity of the trust during the last quarter. Only one transaction closed, but uh, nevertheless, there was a, a period of reasonable amount of activity with several other portfolio companies closing rounds number of which were financed by other investors, not Seraphim, including Astroscale and Altitude Angel. Both of these were announced um, at our interims. I'll provide some more detail about Quadsat, the company that we did invest into, in my next slide. So post the end of the period, we've continued to be busy. Uh, several follow-on investments and one new investment has already closed. None of, we, none of these have yet been announced, so I can't uh, name them and, uh, and focus on them uh, during my presentation today. However, I can say that we're really excited about this new investment that we've made. It's only a small position in an early stage company, but they're focused on the exciting carbon credit market. What they do is they review carbon projects to determine the overall quality and the ability to sequester carbon. Now, this provides much needed transparency and confidence in the giant carbon credit market. So uh, I'm excited to tell you more about that when we speak uh, next quarter. It's also worth uh, noting that um, the portfolio companies have received multiple term sheets from new investors uh, during this quarter on rounds that will close this quarter and potentially uh, the next quarter. So um, uh, interest to invest in our portfolio companies continues to run at high levels. So let's move to the next slide where I'm going to focus on Quadsat. So in March 2023, 
Seraphim completed a follow-on investment of 1 million euros into Quadsat as part of a 9 million euro Series A round. So this round was led by IQ Capital with participation of Seraphim alongside others. And importantly, this is one of the companies that was originated through the Seraphim Space Accelerator. So Quadsat is, 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 is really gaining commercial traction. So they're the only mobile antenna testing company globally. So they've recently been accredited by SOMAP. So this is the satellite operator's minimum antenna performance. And this is a, a, an industry platform that has been agreed by AsiaSat, Utilsat, Imarsat, Intelsat, and SES. And this is for, for testing antennas um, in the industry. So this was a significant milestone that um, Quadsat have achieved. And it's, uh, it's very much a, uh, amongst the first steps to bring them into the leadership position um, for improving antenna performance for the industry. So what they enable is that manufacturers can perform more measurements, they can increase the validity and enable more reliable products for their customers to access good data. So this is a giant addressable market that uh, the Quadsat is focused on. Um, the, the global RF testing equipment market is forecast to reach nearly 5 billion by 2028. And Quadsat is well on their way to achieving leadership in that market. So they've got a range of, uh, of customers already, including some of the biggest satellite constellations, including OneWeb. They've successfully uh, completed their first system and services sale to some of the world's leading satellite antenna companies that were, and terminals. And they've completed commercial missions with customers, including the United Nations and, and Telespatio. And national defense agencies are now really showing a huge amount of interest in this business. So we're really positive around the trajectory of this business. It's a real demonstration um, of our accelerator and how it enables us to be able to reduce the risks and invest into the best performing companies. So we're going to move on to the next slide where I'm going to take a deeper dive um, into the top 10, uh, the companies um, in the portfolio that, that represent 70% of, of NAV. And when you consider that we've got uh, nearly 20% of, uh, of, of NAV in cash, that really is the, the majority of the portfolio. So I'll start with some bad news, I'm afraid, in relating to one of our three listed companies, Arkit, which you'll no longer see in the top 10. As we discussed last quarter, we partially sold down our stake in this business at $8. And today, the share price is down to $1. The market took exception to the terms of a $20, $20 million placement that they undertook last quarter. And outside of the period, Arkit reported its own results that were materially below expectations. They also announced a, a pivot in their strategy and the intention to sell their space assets. So their share price has been punished um, by the market and, um, uh, and, and it's now fallen out of our top 10. So, so that is the bad news. Uh, the rest of the news that I've got to share is actually very good news. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that we experienced a fantastic quarter. We've had record revenues and bookings in key, in key portfolio companies. We've had significant rounds closed, um, uh, AstroScale, Quadsat, Satellite View. We've had substantial term sheets written by other investors, top tier investors for three of the companies in the top 10. And there's been a major regulatory change that's been a key driver for our portfolio companies. So that's the overview of what's been going on um, in the portfolio. Let me take you down to, to look at some of the detail, starting with our largest company, iSci. So iSci has had a fantastic quarter. So they've recorded record contracts, record bookings, record um, uh, revenues. They've, uh, they've announced the closing of a milestone um, uh, uh, contracts with uh, with UAE. And this is a business that's really firing on all cylinders. So this is the world's largest uh, radar satellite company. It very much services the uh, defense and intelligence community and also the climate and insurance community. And business is absolutely booming. Hawkeye um, has uh, had a successful quarter. They've separately, in two different rockets, launched six satellites 
taking their satellite constellation up to 21 operational in orbit today. And that marks them out as the largest constellation for signals intelligence. It really brings down the latency time for them to provide the important data to their customers. This business is, uh, is, is really thriving. So next of all, we've got um, Deorbit. So Deorbit has won multiple tens of millions of dollars contracts during the quarter. And with the European Space Agency and the Italian Space Agency, they've been announced as part of a consortium for 235 million euros for an in-orbit in services contract. This is a first of its, signed, first of its kind contract um, for such activity in Europe. And, uh, and Deorbit is very much um, in the lead. So uh, it's worth noting here that there's been a key driver for in-space activity. There's been a change in regulations. So the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, has approved an important uh, new uh, in-orbit debris rule. So under this rule, um, uh, the, the, the previous rule used to allow satellite operators 25 years after the end of the life of their satellite to remove that satellite from space. And that essentially allowed enough time for the orbital drag of the, of the Earth's gravity to, to pull the satellites in and burn um, in the atmosphere. The new regulation has now changed that to five years, which means that satellite operators now have to um, find a way of returning and removing those satellites after that five-year period. So this rule comes into effect in two years' time, two years after uh, the, this order is adopted, it's focused around US licensed satellites and those operating in the US market. But we believe that the majority of regulators around the world are also going to adopt this. So the reason why I go into such detail here is that this is a really significant change and one that is really going to drive the outlook for three of our most important portfolio companies, Astroscale, Leo Labs, and Deorbit. So I've already talked about the orbit and how they've had a, a, a fantastic quarter, really lead, uh, developing their leadership uh, in the market. Um, Astro Scale has closed a $75 million round, and that round was at the price of their 2022 round, which indicates how investors are, uh, are continuing to prepare to invest into these businesses at uh, robust valuations. And Leo Labs is the, is the market leader in providing uh, data around all of debris in space so that the, the regulators and um, operators can use their live data in order to be able to, to manage their uh, debris uh, mitigation strategies. So this is a really exciting development for the overall portfolio. So I'll talk about two more of the portfolio before um, I move on to the next slide. Uh, satellite view. So three years of effort, and they're just about to launch their first satellite in June. We're really excited about this because this is the first company ever where their satellite will be able to show the heat signature of any building on Earth. And there are so many different applications for that type of, um, of depth of understanding. So customers have been lining up um, to, uh, to work um, with, uh, with this company, and they've signed uh, over $100 million of purchase options from customers who are desperate to get their hands on this important data set. So uh, the final one that I'll talk about is Altitude Angel, which is really on the periphery of our space uh, investment strategy. So PwC have estimated that drones could contribute 45 billion pounds to the UK economy by 2030. And the ability to be able to scale and safely integrate drones into the um, airspace market is paramount. So Project Skyway, which is a project that's developed by Altitude Angels and its partners, which include BT, they're aiming to do exactly that, starting with a 265-kilometer drone superhighway. So this is now actually in the development stage. This um, will be completed later in 2023 and paving the way for the first commercial drone flights between Reading and Coventry in early 2024. So the UK is looking from a regulatory perspective and for an operational perspective to lead the world in this regard. And uh, this is all built around uh, Altitude Angel and their platform for safely managing um, this uh, the drone superhighway. So that's the huge amount of activity that is going on uh, within the portfolio and is really, um, uh, is really not clear 
um, from the pedestrian numbers that we're presenting in relation to the, the performance of, uh, of, of the NAV. So this, uh, can I move to the next slide now, please? I'm going to turn to valuations briefly and really just to shine a light again uh, on our processes. Now, this is a, a terribly busy slide, and it's actually a challenging slide to try and present to you. So the purpose of sharing it with you is that we're constantly refreshing our assessment of the enterprise values of each of our portfolio companies. We take a rigorous approach to doing this, taking account of both public and private marketing data. And alongside that, we use confidential or non-public information from the companies themselves. So we then use this to refresh the enterprise values to then create and calculate the fair values. But in order to create the fair values for the enterprise values, we have to look at the capital structure for each of the businesses. And this includes things like liquidation preferences and anti-dilution rights. Uh, and these are taken into account when we are calculating the fair value of the underlying business. So these different structures help protect the value of our investments where there might be a reduction um, in the enterprise value. So we've not repeated it this quarter, but last quarter I evidenced how within the top 10, there'd been a, si a number of sizable reductions in the enterprise values of individual companies over the last six to nine months. And that's at the same time as other companies like Astroscale and others are continuing to raise money at valuations that are consistent with their previous rounds. So I'm hoping that uh, this sort of level of detail will give you confidence about our rigorous assessment and that our uh, NAV valuations are reflective of the real underlying value of those portfolio companies. So I'm going to move on to the, the final slide now, which really uh, gives me the opportunity just to talk about what's going on in the market more broadly than Seraphim. So Seraphim, um, since 2017, has produced a quarterly report, uh, which we published, called the Seraphim Space Index, which reviews global private investment in the space domain. So in the first quarter of 2023, um, we saw a bounce from the lows of Q4 22, with private investment increasing by over 60% to 1.4 billion. So European transactions, to focus on the continent, were up by nearly 50% in the year to the 31st of March, a record breaking 42 transactions in the quarter. In, indeed, the first quarter of, uh, of activity in Europe was equal to the, the, a half a year of 2022. So the trajectory is really underway. So looking in a little bit more detail, Q1 saw a strong pickup in growth stage investment activity. So there was a record number of B rounds, C rounds, D rounds that were financed globally. So early stage transactions were also strong, 96 transactions closing, and uh, and, and really uh, the level of money that has been invested is really consistent with the, the, the levels in previous quarters, but there's more transactions that are being undertaken. So looking forwards, the, the portfolio has had an excellent quarter. So it's really driven by government engagement and, uh, and the climate activities that the, the portfolio is focused on. This is this has led to record contract wins, lots of ongoing investment activity, and really Western governments have really recognised that space is highly strategic. It's playing a, a, a crucial role in protecting democracy and protecting the planet. And we believe that the portfolio is really well positioned to benefit from this continued government interest. And we anticipate that the recent positive commercial trajectory within the portfolio will continue. And that um, as we continue to release this positive information, that over a period of time, our, uh, our discount will start to close. So uh, thank you for listening today. I'm going to pause there now. And, uh, and along with my colleague, James, we'll take your uh, Q&A. Well, Will, Mark and James, um, thank you for that. Very interesting and useful as always. Let's move on to Q&A. And a reminder to the audience to place the questions in the box on the screen so we can come to them. Um, the first question we have comes from Hannah, who, who is interested in the bounce back in funding that you evidence, Mark. And, and, and she observes that, that 
it feels as though the external environment might have got tougher when we read about Silicon Valley Bank and some of the challenges that, that are being faced in funding markets. So it's interesting in that context to see the recovery that you are reporting. How can we explain that? Well, I'm going to hand over to James um, so that he can address some of these uh, questions. James, do you want to take that? Yeah, happy to, Mark. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Uh, well, I think first observation, based on uh, Mark and I having each worked in, in in venture through multiple downturns, is that irrespective of where we are in the, the macroeconomic cycle, the best businesses always uh, always get funded, um, and we expect that that trends to, uh, to to continue. Needless to say, there 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 has been some um, consequences as a result of uh, of uh, the the crisis around Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, albeit that situation has been stabilised, um, with both the UK and US operations having been uh, taken over. Um, those portfolio companies that were customers of Silicon Valley Bank uh, continue to have uh, access to uh, their existing facilities and indeed new ones. And anecdotally, we are seeing across the portfolio um, uh, new facilities being offered by Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, or, although there's been a change of ownership um, with, uh, with that institution, uh, it continues to, to play an important role in the, uh, in, in, in the ecosystem. So uh, investors are definitely, as a rule, being uh, more discerning about where they're, where they're uh, willing to make new investments. Much of the investment activity within the portfolio over the last 12 months has been principally around in insider-led rounds, so where existing shareholders are supporting the business. But as Mark has alluded to, over the last uh, quarter uh, or, or so, we've increasingly seen the return of new investors being willing to issue term sheets uh, for our portfolio companies, which which we believe is a very positive uh, positive sign. So, in terms of the overall investment activity that's happening in space tech, I think it's fair to say that over the last quarter or so, it has largely bucked the trends of the broader uh, venture ecosystem. Why is that? Some of the reasons that Mark has been saying, whereas other sectors may really be facing very significant um, headwinds as a consequence of the macroeconomic environment. Some of the causes of, uh, of, of those, those headwinds are actually benefiting our company. So principally, particularly the, the geopolitical um, uh, tensions that we see uh, uh, both in Ukraine, but, but also um, uh, uh, around, around China and Taiwan. That has really turbocharged um, uh, the incentives for governments to look to engage with the commercial space sector, with companies in our portfolio being beneficiary. And to build on Mark's earlier comments, um, uh, we have seen companies in this quarter with eight and indeed in one instance, nine figure bookings during the quarter. So uh, we, we remain pretty optimistic, uh, whilst also sober to the realities of uh, the fact there may be continued turbulence within the funding market through the rest of this year. Thank you, James. Um, and a follow-on question really from Kieran, who asks in a more cash constrained environment, um, the extent to which the requirement to, for your portfolio companies to reduce overheads, extend their cash runways, whether this is at the expense of their development and growth rates. Uh, Mark, do you want me to take that one? Yes, please, that, yeah. That, that one uh, uh, again. Um, so e evidence so far, based on the trajectory of our, our, our key portfolio companies, is that, that we haven't seen a, a slowdown. I, indeed, the, the overall growth of the portfolio continues at a pace. Like many companies, both space-related venture and, and indeed outside of uh, venture, clearly everyone is being more prudent with, uh, with, with how, they're, how they're spending uh, their, their, their money. Um, uh, but our companies are continuing to, to, to grow. Uh, the, the, the increase in cadence of their expenditure may have been uh, abated, but in most instances, what we're not seeing is companies with wide-scale layoffs or reducing of overheads. It's just that they have reduced the pace at which they are increasing their, 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 their overheads. Uh, and again, in terms of the traction that we're seeing for the businesses, we're not seeing that having an adverse uh, impact uh, uh, currently. 
Thank you, James. Um, and I've got two questions from Giovanni and Mark, which I'm going to combine. They're both on SPACs, one which is rather generic um, or more generic, um, which is about given the recent poor performance of SPACs, has it changed your opinion as their utility as a tool for investment exit? How would you evaluate the pros and cons today, I guess, and would you look to use them as an exit route in the future? Uh, well, clearly the share price performance of, uh, of, of SPACs generally has been very poor um, since the start of last year, and that, that clearly includes several of uh, our, our companies. Um, uh, it's worth noting that the companies uh, of ours that, that have SPACs, as a rule, have progressed really quite substantially since uh, since they listed. So Spire, for example, uh, growing at, at close to 100% year on year and now with 100 million of, of annual recurring revenues uh, and AST having uh, now proven their, their, their technology in space to enable uh, 4G connectivity direct to handsight um, from, uh, from a satellite, which we believe ultimately is going to be a game changer. So the company is fundamentally um, looking look in pretty good shape, notwithstanding the very disappointing uh, share price performance. In terms of looking forward, this being a liquidity route, it's worth noting that uh, although um, the rate of, uh, of, 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 of SPAC mergers within the sector and elsewhere has clearly slowed over the last 12 months, space companies are continuing to use SPACs as a route for, for, for going public. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't rule it out, um, uh, notwithstanding um, current market challenges. Those companies that are more mature in our portfolio right now, their strategy is more to look to build towards um, a traditional uh, IPO in favour of, of, of a SPAC merger. But um, uh, they, they, they remain uh, open to uh, all avenues for, for ultimately becoming public. And we do see companies becoming public as one of the key avenues for our best performing companies in terms of ultimately uh, delivering uh, uh, some form of liquidity for our investment. Yeah, but it's worth noting we don't we don't really consider them to be an exit because you know we wouldn't we wouldn't be exiting the business at that point. It's a, it's an efficient form of financing uh, to continue the growth of the businesses rather than an exit. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, James. Very very helpful. And 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 just a um, more specific follow on question from a different Mark who who notes the um, plans that were in place for deorbit to SPAC. Um, the question, I guess, is around future listing plans and progress with this business. Yes, well, just to, to remind everyone that uh, uh, Deorbit announced um, uh, quite some time ago at the tail end of, of last summer um, uh, that it had come to agreement uh, with, uh, with, with, with the SPAC not to proceed with, uh, with that transaction uh, due to uh, the, the, the minimum cash threshold uh, not having been uh, not having been been met, um, so as Mark's alluded to, Deorbit has had a a, a very positive uh, quarter and remains on uh, a very strong uh, trajectory. Uh, and again, I think this is a good example of a, a business where ultimately we believe in terms of sort of optimizing value for for our shareholders over the long term. Uh, Deorbit looks like a good candidate uh, to become a public company, uh, albeit I think it's fair to say that we would anticipate it at this point remaining private for, for, for the next few years. Thank you, James. Um, a question from Matthew, who, who observes that, that, that the value of the portfolio um, has been stable. His question really is, is outside of the listed stock that, that Mark already highlighted, What's been the volatility underlying that aggregate portfolio stability, if any? Mark, do you want me to yes, have please. First, crack at, first crack at that? So we, we shared some information relating to this in, in, in our interims uh, last quarter, which largely remains, uh, remains true. So the, the, the short answer, Nick, is that there are a number of companies, particularly if we're focusing on our, our top 10, that have seen um, substantial uh, reductions in enterprise value over the course of the, 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 the last uh, six to 12 months. Uh, but those reductions have effectively been offset 
uh, by increases in, in valuation, typically tied to uh, new external uh, funding events that have happened for other companies, such that the two have, have effectively largely uh, netted out. It, it's worth noting that actually our, our, our private portfolio is performing strongly and is, is valued um, uh, materially above cost it, to the overall portfolio level that uh, unfortunately the impact of the, the poor performance of our, our listed holdings has, has obviously dragged down the overall position of the fund. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Um, a couple more questions. The, the, the first is from Max, who, who notes your comments about the vast majority of holdings um, have over 12 months cash runway. Um, the question then is, is I, I guess, um, how many don't? And looking at the top 10, um, how many are planning additional funding rounds over that period? Yeah, Mark, I'll take I'll take that one. So can provide uh, guidance that based on latest expectations and clearly those expectations can change quarter to quarter, depending on comp individual portfolio company performance. But as of today, the guidance we have from our portfolio companies is that there are only four companies out of the entire portfolio that require additional um, funding before the end of 2023. And of those four companies, three of them have term sheets in, in, in hand and expect to close funding rounds uh, within, within the, next, uh, the next quarter or so. Uh, within, the, within the top 10, we only have one company um, uh, that, uh, that, that requires funding during 2023, uh, and that company, Allspace, we're anticipating closing uh, around imminently. We do have uh, a number of other companies within the top 10 that are active in fundraising, but from a very different position of responding to inbound interest rather than because of a need to, 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 to fundraise in, 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 in the near term. Uh, as Mark alluded to, we've uh, uh, received a number of term sheets from new investors, including some very large investors um, for, for, for companies within our top 10 that we would anticipate based on the progress of those rounds, we'll, we'll be closing some of those transactions during the course of the next quarter. Uh, and hence, we'd be hope, hopeful to be able to, to share some more detail uh, at, uh, at the next set of results. Yeah, just worth just uh, just chiming in there that, you know, the, the term sheets are from, you know, the, the top tier leading investors in growth, um, leading um, players, uh, corporate investors, um, so, you know, it re it, it, there really is uh, real demand and interest in our portfolio. Uh, I would say as well, generally speaking, at robust valuations as well, that reinforce um, the, 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 the carrying value uh, that we've included within this set of results. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thanks, Mark. There's, there's a question here on, I guess it's portfolio construction, really, and the fact that ISI is approaching 20% of the NAV is a luxurious problem because it means that the, the, the business has um, succeeded. Is there a point at, at which you become at all uncomfortable that a single investment has a disproportionate impact on the overall? That's certainly something that we will um, uh, continue to be mindful of, uh, as indeed we, we, we are. We are looking to, to take a diversified approach to investment and, and spreading of, uh, of, uh, uh, of risk. Uh, as a reminder, companies like ISI are privately held companies, and therefore there isn't uh, necessarily an immediate path of, uh, of, of, of liquidity as a private company even in a scenario that it becomes an, uh, an outsized contributor to, um, uh, to, to the overall value. I would also remind everyone that the nature of, uh, of venture capital generally is that it's a small proportion of your investments that ultimately deliver the lion's share of, uh, of return and, uh, and performance. So from our perspective, it wouldn't be especially unusual if we do start to see over time our better performing companies representing a, a meaningful proportion of, uh, of, of, of NAV. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Will. Those are the only questions um, that we have outstanding. Um, finally, let me just close with the disclaimer um, that Hannah's just going to bring up that, that we didn't have the chance to share right at the start. But thank you, 
everyone for joining today. Thank you to the Seraphim team. Um, and we look forward to hearing future progress from you all again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.